There's some handouts, so if some of you sitting in the back want to come up front, uh, it'd be great. Uh, so we can have a nice intimate group in this huge room. So this session is called uh, The Secret Life of Trees, and um, it's really my pleasure to have this group of uh, presenters here, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, hearing from our three presenters. I'm not going to, uh, let's see, okay, no? Okay. Bill, that was all the business you could drum up. Okay. Okay, so our, our three speakers today is uh, Keith Bowers, who's going to be talking about uh, an overview uh, of the city, and uh, uh, followed by Mary Dennis, and then uh, Dennis McLeod. Uh, all their bios are in the uh, handout, so I'm not going to go through uh, reading the, bi the bios, so uh, you have that information already. So this is a, sort of a little self-serving because, uh, uh, you know, how, plants come to my house to die, uh, and uh, <laughs> Terry doesn't, you know, you don't like hearing that, but, uh, you know, so I think I run a hospice for plants because nothing survives, uh, everything that I've that I've ever planted has died. And, um, and if it's not for you know, those pesky animals uh, who are peeing all over the trees, uh, helping kill them. Uh, so uh, and I thought I'd get you know, Sarah Palin to come and uh, help the trees in the median in front of my house uh, uh, grow, but uh, that didn't really help. So, um, uh, so that's partially why uh, uh, Dana and I uh, decided to have this session to really talk about trees and growing trees in urban areas. So uh, without any further ado, we'll hear from Keith Bao. Thanks. Uh, glad everybody could join us this afternoon after a nice lunch and time out. I hope everybody got to go outside a little bit. Um, I'm taking a little bit of a different approach. Uh, when I was asked to talk about trees, I thought, well, um, I have some pretty good speakers that are following me that can um, talk about trees. I thought I would take a step back and talk about the forest and seeing the forest from the trees and recognizing that in new urbanism, we're dealing with that gradient from rural to urban areas and how important our forest and why should we be looking at forests from a conservation and restoration standpoint? And the context at which we design new communities um, based on new urbanism principles and tenets, how forest conservation and forest restoration fits into that. So I'm going to hopefully address two uh, st uh, uh, statements here. The role of landscape ecology and conservation biology in ensuring a resilient landscape. And then how can the science of landscape ecology and conservation biology make new urbanism communities more responsive to forest fragmentation, loss of biodiversity, and true sustainability? So interestingly enough, just a little bit of background, North America actually has more forest than any other continent or region in the world. Um, sometimes we think about the Amazon and South America and the forest down there, but actually North America is, is uh, um, pretty endowed with forest. Um, much of that is up in Canada, um, but fortunately enough, there's a lot in the United States as well. Although these maps here, the map on the left, depicts from 1620 all the way up to 1920, the extent of forest cover and then the loss of forest cover. And the map on the right is the area of virgin forest left today, which is essentially none. Um, so we're dealing with either cut over once or cut over twice or even in some cases cut over three times forest. But this is a map today of what the different types or ecosystem, forest ecosystems that exist in the United States. And it's just really 
to show that there are many, um, many varieties of different forests throughout the United States, all having their own char characteristics and specific ecosystem functions and services. And so those ecosystem services really are influencing uh, the climate. It protects soil and stores nutrients. And obviously, forests harbor a tremendous amount of biodiversity. Now, back in 1994, um, there was a valuation done on all those ecosystem services or natural capital that forests provide. And based on that analysis, um, it was determined that at that time, a uh, forest, a hectare of forest, was worth about $969 a year on an annual basis. So if we begin looking at um, multiplying those hectares of forest across the United States for every year, the services that those forests provide in terms of natural capital is quite extensive. And many times in the work that we all do in terms of planning and design, we very rarely take into account that natural capital and how that really should be playing or how it should be um, influencing the bottom line in terms of looking at forest ecosystems and the value of forest ecosystems on the site. So as I mentioned before, I'm going to talk a little bit less about specific trees and talk more about forest. And first, what I want to do is just go over briefly this whole idea of island biogeography because it really plays out in forest ecosystems across the United States as well. And in island biogeography, what researchers and scientists found in doing research back in the 1950s and 60s was that um, basically um, islands that were, f or air land area that was flooded, they looked at the species on these islands and found that the larger islands had greater number of diversity, a greater number of species. And in other words, their immigration to those islands was greater than the extinction rate. And so they were able to keep that genetic diversity um, going. But as the size of the islands decreased, the less diverse they were, and the extinction rates started to exceed the immigration rates into those islands. And then the distance between each island played a major role in that immigration of new species or species to each one of these islands. And while that was important in terms of looking at it from a true island standpoint, what we discovered and what conservation biologists have discovered is that this plays out on the landscape as well when we start looking at the different patches of different types of ecosystems on the landscape. So if we think of forest and forest patches as these islands, the same kind of rules play out there. That the larger the patch, the more diverse we have of species there, and the more resilient that patch is in terms of keeping the diversity of species. Um, the smaller the patch, the less diverse, and the further apart they are, the less diverse, and, and we're looking at um, um, uh, extinction rates greater than immigration rates. And why is that important? Well, we all sort of, we hear in the press and we all talk about um, climate change. And while that's a huge issue and we need to continue talking about it, very rarely are people talking about what's going on in terms of the loss of biodiversity around the world. In fact, many, many scientists are now calling this the sixth great extinction. Um, and that we're losing species now based on fossil records about a thousand times faster than the last great extinction that the Earth um, experience. So now we're losing species at a, at a very, very fast pace and it's sort of right under our noses and we're not really doing much about it. And one of the primary reasons that we're losing these species is because of habitat fragmentation. It's because we're fragmenting those forests, we're fragmenting the habitat of these species. And so conservation biologists have come up with um, uh, uh, ways to look at designing um, uh, habitat patches and thinking about habitat corridors. And as that illustration on the left shows that obviously the bigger the patch, the better off we are. Um, one big patch is better than four small disconnected patches. One big patch is better than small disconnected patches that are close together. Um, and then patches that have a corridor or connected are much better than patches that are separated. So when we begin applying these kinds of principles from a design and planning standpoint on our forest ecosystems, and we begin thinking about planning a new urbanist community, 
or begin thinking about that transect from rural to urban areas, then we can start overlaying these kinds of concepts, the science of conservation biology and landscape ecology on that transect to begin looking at how we can better protect the diversity of species out there and, pro and protect these patches. So if we look at this from both a, a, a uh, a real life example of what a patch might look like, what a corridor might look like, and also conceptualize it on the right hand side there. And basically in landscape ecology we have these patches, these forest patches, in this case we're talking about forest. We have corridors that uh, intertwine and um, uh, uh, spread across the landscape between patches. And then all the background is called the matrix. And that matrix is really what is between these patches and corridors. And that matrix is extremely important too because species don't necessarily just stay in these forest patches and corridors, they travel across the matrix. So when we think about new urbanism communities, we need to be thinking about how we can enhance and make that matrix more viable for species to be able to get from one patch to another. So again, if we start using those principles of conservation biology and landscape ecology, we can begin thinking about not only how are we designing these communities for people, but how are we designing them for species as well. So forest patches, as this uh, uh, Google images shows, forest patches come in all shapes and all sizes. And depending on where you are in North America, different types of species use these forests and have different requirements in terms of their breeding, in terms of their foraging, in terms of their whole life cycle. And so wherever we're working um, in North America, it's really important to know what species, what are the sort of keystone species or another term umbrella species, those species that may represent many other species in terms of their habitat requirements are. So we can begin thinking about how to plan and site new urbanism communities in the landscape. The other important factor that a lot of people don't think about is what's called interior forest. In interior forest are a specific type of, uh, or a, a, a type of forest patch. And interior forests typically are unbroken forest at least 300 feet um, from the forest to non-forest boundary, so from the edge. Um, their size is anywhere from 50 to 250 acres at a minimum. And typically in forest, there's an edge effect that happens from the edge of non-forest into forest. Um, you have this edge effect where you have a different microclimate you have um, uh, different nutrient cycling, you have different energy regimes, and that's where you begin to get a lot of invasive species that come into forests. Um, the climate is different there, and there are some species that can't survive, even though that is forest, they can't survive in that edge forest. They have to have interior forest. And in fact, in the United States, in the eastern United States, well, that's one of the biggest areas that we're losing really fast is these interior forests. And one of the species that uses interior forests is the red cockadated woodpe woodpecker. Um, the wood this woodpecker is found mostly in the longleaf pine forests throughout the southeast, although the, the longleaf pine forests used to be over 90 million acres that stretch from Virginia all the way down to Texas, and now only 5% of that forest is left. And even within that 5% of that forest, very little interior forest is left. But in fact, if we look at this, the, the, the larger that patch size is, then the greater the suitability it is, the greater suitability for that woodpecker to live. Um, and then also the distance to the nearest patch. Um, if you have a, a two patches that are close together, the higher the suitability as those patches begin to um, uh, distance themselves from one another, there's less suitability. So there's direct evidence out there from different species that some of these principles in conservation biology hold up. And so if we think about interior patches, um, in this case, we have an edge effect around all forest. And so that interior forest is really that green area in the middle that supports only certain types of species. All the rest is still forest, but it has those uh, edge effects that prevent some species from inhabiting that forest. And if we were to look at this as a minimum 50 acre size here, again, a minimum of 300 feet from the edge, that kind of defines these interior habitats. 
But what happens when we fragment that forest and say we put a road through that forest there, we may think that, okay, we still have two large patches. Um, but in essence, we've really reduced the amount of interior forest and in fact uh, drastically reduced it to maybe 15% uh, of what it used to be in this example here. And in fact, that, that uh, forest patch that's left, that interior forest patch that's left may not be suitable to support some of those species. Um, that need a larger interior forest. So that's essentially what we're doing in terms of the landscape out there, how fragmentation begins to affect these different species. And I think that there are ways that working with new urbanism that we can start overlaying these kinds of ecological principles on some of the transects, looking at how we code uh, the landscape, um, how we come up with principles and begin thinking about how these uh, influences can really enhance uh, the kinds of communities that we're designing. The other is, is corridors. Corridors provide a tremendous avenue for species to move. Um, and so corridors are very important as well, especially when they begin connecting other forest patches. In this case, it could be a corridor that follows a river or maybe it's a corridor of just connected forest remnant patches, but those corridors are extremely important in providing species, um, uh, areas for species to move in as well. And that con connectivity can be achieved in really two main ways. One is we can kind of manage the whole landscape for um, uh, movement of species. And one way we can do that is through what we call uh, stepping stones, where the actual patches may not be connected directly, but we have smaller patches that species can go through that matrix to a, to a stepping stone, through the matrix to another stepping stone, and then finally to another patch. Um, or it can be a continuous connection as shown in that bottom illustration there. So depending on the types of species we have and how they move across the landscape, we can begin planning the landscape to help facilitate that movement and provide the type of habitat for all the life cycles of these species. Um, so what happens when we fragment forest? Well, invasive species happen, and that's a really big, that's another big determinant, deter, determinant for species. Um, we're seeing in eastern forest, we're seeing in southern forest and out west, um, a proliferation of invasive species. And while it looks green to us, many of the species that survive on certain plants or the timing of certain uh, flowering and fruiting of plants or even the structure, in fact, some, some viburnums in the forest provide uh, uh, their branch structure in such a way that certain species will use them, but if you get a non-native species in there that doesn't have the same, same branching structure, those same species won't use that shrub at all. So there are, there are many facets of uh, native plants that we really don't even know yet how species use them, but they do. And when we get invasive species in like this, um, they uh, replace those native plants and we lose those species. The other thing is um, what scientists are calling the ecology of fear. In many parts of the United States, we've lost our top predators, our, our top keystone species, the wolf, the cougar. Um, and what that has done is it's, it's, it's caused this what, what's termed a trophic cascade where now we all know in the east deer just proliferate. And when deer proliferate, they eat all the understory. And in fact, many of the forests that we have in the United States and the eastern United States are, what's, are what we're calling now dead forests because there are no new saplings, uh, no new trees taking their place. Um, and, and that is because the deer don't have any predators out there. Um, so this ecology of fear, when we had predators out there, we actually had a much healthier landscape. And in fact, Otto Leopold pointed this out in the San County Almanac and um, some of his other work that he's done back in the 1930s and 40s. We're now just beginning to recognize that. And even data here shows that um, small forest fragments have elevated Lyme disease risk. So again, there are things that are being manifested out there that are literally taking 100 years or more um, as we begin uh, fragmenting our landscape and fragmenting these forests that we're just beginning to see. 
And then hydrology, um, the whole runoff regime. And we've seen um, areas where we may have a stream that's c completely connected to the floodplain, but when we begin fragmenting the forest and losing that land cover, that stream incises into the landscape and um, causes all kinds of sedimentation and loss of aquatic habitat as well. And then we have climate change and how these forests are on the move. They're moving right now. In fact, um, scientists are even mapping how fast these species are moving and under different uh, scenarios um, in the future uh, based on uh, uh, carbon emissions, um, what kind of forest are we going to see in different parts of the country. And so as we think about these communities and think about designing trees or conserving or restoring forests, we need to be thinking about not necessarily what's there now, but what might be there in the next 50 to 100 years. Um, but this is interesting. In fact, most people, you know, we think about trees and their ability to store carbon, and that's true, but um, really it's the soil, right? That green there represents the amount of carbon stored in soil. That little brown or orange line represents the amount of carbon stored in trees for uh, different areas of the country. And so we see that really soils are the key here. And even if we're going to go in and fragment the forest or we're going to um, look at doing other landscape modifications in the forest, it's really key to have healthy soils. Um, and I'm sure my other speakers will talk about um, the necessity to have healthy soils for healthy trees. So how can science of landscape ecology and conservation biology make new urbanism communities more responsive to this forest fragmentation and loss of biodiversity and true sustainability? Well, first, there are programs underway both on a continental scale and a state scale to look at reconnecting forest um, habitat. And in fact, this on the left here is some work done by David Theobald out in Colorado State University where they're looking at continental um, uh, networks of forest and wildlife habitat. Um, that will begin to connect up from a continent level and be able to support those keystone species, those carnivores that we've lost in the landscape. So if we're thinking about a new urbanism community, does it relate to any of these wild ways or wild lifelines and what David's calling it? Or even on the East Coast here, there's an effort underway now to create an East Coast wild way from Canada, the maritime provinces of Canada all the way down to Florida. And again, if we're designing a new urbanism community, then how can that community support these kinds of conservation initiatives? And even on the state level, um, Florida has been a leader, actually, in the nation in looking at um, greenway, greenway networks for, for species movement. And Maryland's done the same thing with their green print program. So again, as we begin thinking about new urbanism communities and where they're sited on the landscape and the context they fit in, how can they support these kinds of efforts that are underway? There's really three attributes of forest ecology that we need to be considering when we think about planting on the landscape. One is the composition of the forest. It's genetic diversity, species diversity, population, the species associations, ecosystem diversity. The structure of the forest, which as designers and planners, we tend to go to right away because it's the physical form of the forest and what's happening there. And then the function of the forest. And the function sometimes is very rarely seen. Those are those processes that happen um, in the forest, like mineral uh, cycling and how they affect uh, uh, succession and disturbance and energy capture and, and trophic cascades and those sorts of things. But all three of these attributes need to be considered when we're thinking about looking at forests, conserving forests, and restoring forests. So planning forest landscapes for new urbanism. First, first I think that you know, the CNU charter and principles are great. Um, and uh, uh, what CNU is all about, I think, is really about preserving these types of landscapes and working within the context of these landscapes. So it would be really good to build off of the charter and principles that are already developed to look at landscape ecology and conservation biology and how that can be integrated into that, char those charter, that charter and principles. 
Um, sound science is extremely important. You know, every, every site, every region of the country um, harbors different species and they all have different requirements. So what might work in Florida may not work in Maryland, may not work in Colorado, may not work in Missouri. Um, and so we need to be really be looking at sound science and making sure that whatever planning initiatives we come up with is based on that science. The other is stay connected. And what I mean by that is that if we have forests that are already connected, and we've got a big forest patch, that those forest patches are already connected to other forests in the landscape, the best thing we can do is keep that connection there. And in fact, I would argue that the most sustainable the most sustainable lead design building in the world, if it's placed in an area where it fragments forest, then it isn't sustainable at all. We're completely ignoring the ecological functions and the carrying capacity of that land by putting that sustainable building right in the middle of that forest. So stay connected is really important. Recon reconnect and restore so the, the areas that aren't connected, can we reconnect them and restore those areas within the confines or within the um, uh, uh, planning of our new urbanism community. Be one with the matrix. So that matrix that I talked about is really important. That can help facilitate species movement and help facilitate species diversity in your project. So if you can find ways of working with street trees, working with uh, community pocket parks and other things to really reinforce the whole science behind how species move through the landscape, then that will really help as well. Um, embrace change. Um, the, you know, climate's changing. Um, we're going to see changes in species movement, so we've got to be adaptable and ready to embrace that change as we think about uh, planning and design. And then lastly, to really celebrate biodiversity. You know, new urbanism is all about mixed use. It's all about pulling people together. It's all about um, uh, living, it's all about bringing different cultures together and so I would add in there all life on earth. We should really be thinking about all life on earth and how these new communities can support that. So there are, there are sort of generic um, uh, information out there about different types of uh, species, um, what their patch area is, what their requirements are, um, their different uh, uh, <coughs> There are different uh, matrix out there in terms of corridor widths for different species. So all this information is available. So we can at least start from a, a sort of large program and then work down to being species specific. And then lastly, I would just say that designing forest landscapes for new urbanism, continue to use sound science, develop forest conservation typologies and codes. We have typologies and codes for streets. Why don't we have them for species? Why don't we have them for biodiversity? Because that's extremely important. Keep the canopy closed. Wherever we make disturbances in forests, really just trying to keep that canopy closed overhead is extremely important in terms of all those edge effects that I talked about. Mimic forest corridors. For example, uh, uh, what I call living streets. We can call green streets or complete streets. But think about those streets in terms of biodiversity, species movement through those streets, neotropical songbirds. We have, um, maybe you have a mix of understory and overstory canopy and different types of, of uh, uh, trees through there to, to provide the habitat for those neotropical songbirds. Mind the matrix, we already talked about that, and then practice adaptive management. All this needs to be adaptive, we need to adapt over time, and we need to allow these communities to adapt the management of these sites over a period of time as well. Um, we did this for North Carolina, um, uh, uh, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, looking at, uh, in this case, uh, Landscape patches and corridors, the site in the yellow is Carolina North, new part of the university where we mapped out the corridors in the light blue and dark blue and the patches in green and basically looked at interior forest patches and were able to work with the university to keep all of their development for Carolina North out of these interior patches and to preserve these major corridors that run through the landscape, not only on their property, but throughout the Chapel Hill area. So there are ways of providing, of looking at landscape ecology and conservation biology and overlaying it on the site and looking at how you can um, uh, blend in uh, these communities to support that type of thing. Thank you very much.
So I'm, I'm going to focus on civic trees. Oops. I'm Mary Dennis. I'm currently living in uh, Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, I think trees make some of the greatest spaces in our urban environment. And actually cannot imagine living in a place without stately trees to shade our streets, our sidewalks, parks, bring grace and seasonal beauty to our neighborhoods, our homes. We celebrate them as historic and iconic elements of history and culture. They're memorialized and championed. <clears throat> we draw incredibly beautiful plans and illustrate them showing shade trees as key to good urban life and placemaking. <clears throat> They're the first thing we think of to improve the quality of the public realm. But trees are much more than just beautiful things. They have all kinds of benefits. Reducing stormwater runoff reduces pollution and sedimentation in, to our water bodies that protects water quality, reduces flood risks and sewer overflows. Heat island mitigation. Cleaner air reduces respiratory diseases and public health costs. Reduction in noise. Attractive streets make, uh, have much more business vitality and increase real estate values. They improve pedestrian safety, increase walkability, and provide a connection to nature in the urban fabric. One acre of trees pulls two to three tons of carbon from the atmosphere. And that's approximately one city block, 200 by 200. And nine billion tons and increasing is pumped into our atmosphere annually. <clears throat> this all these combined benefits add up. Um, in New York City, it's $100 million annually, the benefit of their street urban forests. That's a benefit of $209 per tree for their total forest. Um, so they are, uh, trees are very important to the sustainable urban planning and so what happened? Where, how did we get here? Why is so many of our urban um, environment barren of trees? Where once we had this, we now get this. And replacement guidelines for trees under utility wires require trees no taller than 25 feet. Short trees obstruct views of street, of street signs and storefronts. They'll never provide a closed canopy or shade our streets and sidewalks. They'll and or provide all the environmental benefits of a large tree. And once they're limbed up to meet clearances, a small tree won't add up to much. And little trees don't live long. <laughs> This is what we get. <laughs> this is what we want. <clears throat> Here, I don't know the rationale. There's no overhead utilities. We um, are just getting a tall hedge here instead of creating a nice, pleasant space. So are utilities to blame? That was kind of how I thought I would start this, you know? Why, why can't we have great city street shade trees anymore? And um, looks like with this um, utility diagram of what is acceptable way to plant trees, shady streets and sidewalks could be a thing of the past. 
and double whammy, what insurance company would cover that house? Add in underground utilities, their placement in the street, and check this list out. Where can there be a place to plant a tree? How much of the public right away can be dominated and devoted to utilities? There's no possible continuous canopy cover possible with these street guidelines. So, what makes a good street tree? And specifically, a good shade street. They need to have good branch structure, ability to tolerate air, water, dust, and atmospheric pollution, they need to be well-behaved, not heave sidewalks, and have planting um, infrastructure that's compatible with the urban fabric, be able to withstand storms, tolerate road salts, be climate-specific, and Pretty amazing any tree can fit, fulfill all those requirements and can survive in the middle of a road. <laughs> There's some great tools out there now that can help us um, bring trees back and see how to use them. GIS mapping is a good an, an analytical tool. You can separate tree canopies, pervious and impervious services, land uses, flood zones, soils, hydrology, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so by studying these layers, you can see where um, patches and things need to be addressed. They can be used as a strategic tool to target specific things such as heat island cooling, creating better pedestrian networks, um, cooling hotspots. And then as a management tool for city foresters, they can uh, map and know exactly the species, diversity, location, health, size, and locations of the, of the urban forest. And tools that help the municipalities um, map Oh, there's two out there, um, iTree and LeafSnap, which works um, as a photo recognition tool so that you don't need to be a botanist to um, go out there and help survey your street trees. And this one also, um, you, can put, you can place locations on the, as you're mapping and surveying. So, as new urbanists, uh, we have been breaking the rules. Um, we've um, been changing um, street, streets and uses in buildings, and now we need to break a few more. So, here's some new rules. We need to limb up, allow canopy trees to mature above utility lines, and select trees without a central leader um, require sensitive pruning. Insist that utility placements and pruning does not jeopardize the growth and health of shade trees and the ecological benefits they provide. Design for the pedestrian, re reduce car travel lanes rather than sidewalks and tree verges allow for closely spaced trees, and for a continuous tree canopy, that would be 20 to 30 feet on center, depending on species, or approximately 10% less than the mature canopy cover. 
Repair the sidewalk, don't cut the tree down, use permeable paving and provide an adequate uh, planting bed around the, around the tree. Pervious, impervious paving restricts the root growth, obviously, and, um, and, and kills the soil, essentially. <laughs> but pervious paving allows water to infiltrate protects the soil from compaction, reduces stormwater runoff, and aids in water infiltration. Where streets and sidewalks are too narrow for, um, uh, for street tree verges, we can um, enlarge our street lexicon include more street sections with the simple greens with no utility uh, conflicts. This, is, this has been well applauded. I'd love to see more, more of this. And one logical place to begin are in our parking lots. They can become urban carbon sinks, multi-use spaces, and shady groves. And uh, here's a few examples of some well-behaved parking in a neighborhood, the urban core, and on an arterial. Harness nature <clears throat> to achieve maximum environmental, social, and economic benefits. You need to adapt, integrate, and implement higher standards and management practices for green infrastructure and all that. This plan um, includes a 50-acre nursery. It uh, harvests rainwater and uh, recycles gray water and has a sewage treatment plant. Dur talk to Duro about that this is his fabulous plan. <laughs> um, and this, I do not even consider eye candy. It's a glorified, expensive, uh, non-duck prison lead certified rain garden, but it's definitely not good urbanism. The High Line, although it doesn't have trees, it recycles all its rainwater to support the um, plantings and is a completely immersive and, um, experience enjoyed by thousands year round. And these pedestrian ways are actually um, stormwater catchments in disguise. They're supporting large trees and um, um, are very civic. They work um, well in the city. They don't have to look like a ditch. And here a beautiful rain garden uh, plaza in Seattle. So uh, we need to set some higher standards. Um, um, we need to be a little bit more specific and uh, clear about the landscape. Um, in this case, I would say um, we need to reverse this and write an ordinance that protects shade trees and um, instead of giving the utilities first call. And we need to, spe uh, we need to specifically s s s uh, require large trees, uh, not just numbers of trees. So for a parking lot, for instance, a typical code would say minimum landscaping 5% for total paved surface. But if you uh, require a performance standard such as 50% shade cover within 15 years, you're not taking up necessarily any more of the 5% landscape for paved areas, but you've greatly increased the uh, performance, of, e e environmental performance of trees in the paved area. And as a result of the Dutch elm disease, um, most um, municipalities now have um, requirements for diversity, but um, I don't, uh, there, it's a little bit diversity for diversity's sake. You have 
an elm and uh, I'm, well you have a zelkovia and then you have a ginkgo and then you have a plane tree and a cherry and a little pole and a this and that it just doesn't add up so um, this when I first heard about it was um, a no-brainer choose similar um, uh, shape branches and leaf textures to um, maintain a, a unity and harmony on your streets so there's no excuse for haphazard diversity um, you need to see the city in the context of the region and the street in the context of the neighborhood you need to require um, utilities to work with the forester and obtain permits for any work that's going to impact street trees, there needs to be good tree protection ordinances. <clears throat> you need to specify large trees. This kind of goes without saying. Prevent mistakes. Trees near dirt. I think Dennis is going to speak more on this. The um, early regular um, pruning and maintenance pre um, prevents more costly um, maintenance in the future, so it's a value to um, take good care of young trees so that they will grow up to be healthy. Use good plant material and proper site preparation. And even um, inconsequential um, seemingly benign things take a toll on trees and another pet peeve dog do and feces <laughs> so we need to start now we need to start planting lots of trees lots of shade trees uh, many of our big urban canopy trees are in decline so the time is now that's it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis McLeod. I'm a landscape architect with Olin, a landscape firm headquartered in Philadelphia with a branch in. Los Angeles. Um, I'm going to talk about the city as an arboretum. We're going to leave Keith's forest. Uh, our office is in the city of Philadelphia and a lot of our projects are very urban and we haven't achieved the Nirvana cities that Mary just talked about with the correct uh, ordinances in place. Um, towns and cities in many parts of North America were carved out of a primeval woodland as Keith told us. Any trees in these early first and earliest settlements were probably vestigial remnants from the uh, original forest. Uh, many of the trees we plant in our cities are native species that still occur in these remnant and fragmented forests that surround them, particularly in the northeast. The environment in these forests, of course, is very different from that in the cities into which we plant these trees with the expectation that they will survive. Trees in our cities live or rather survive in a rather extreme artificial construct uh, that is uh, totally unnatural compared to where they occur naturally. It is only in the past 20 or so years that our knowledge of how to grow trees in cities has expanded exponentially due to the work of people like the arborist Alex Shigo in his book A New Tree Biology and the work of James Urban, a landscape architect. People do love trees, perhaps too much, we respond viscerally to them, and because of this, we somewhat anthropomorphize them in odd ways. Some of us has crocheted sweaters to protect them from the winter cold. Others exercise a bit of S&M to brutally bend them to their will. But uh, leaving these more quirky manifestations of tree love aside, my talk is about the basics of growing them successfully in the city and thinking about them in design terms. In terms of design, this image shows a well-grown young street tree of pyramidal form. 
This tree is not too widespreading for the narrow street and sidewalk where it's been placed. The tree is one of the better cultivars of calorie pear, a non-native tree that grows really well in the cities in the Northeast, but you have to get the right variety. This image shows it in bloom with flowers that repeat the color of the trim on the row house behind it. The color even works with the red truck, which will disappear in a few hours when the parking meter expires. The truck reappears on another street beneath the flowering redbud tree. The form of this tree is opposite, it's very different from the calorie pear. It's a widespreading parasol, but it is an understory flowering tree. The color doesn't go so well with the red truck or the red brick uh, behind. At the opposite end of the scale spectrum, of course, are the large chase trees that Mary has been urging us to plant in lieu of these smaller flowering ones. This is an example of Platinus acerifolia on the banks of the Tiber River in Rome. It is a hybrid that was developed about two or three hundred years ago between the native North American uh, uh, Platinus occidentalis and uh, the oriental plane tree from the Middle East. I'm sorry, Platinus acerif, uh, between uh, Platinus occidentalis and orientalis. Uh, big trees, however, do not require big spaces. This is the main street of Charlottesville, Virginia. These are very tall, uh, I believe they are willow oaks. Uh, it's a pedestrian mall in the, uh, down the middle of this main shopping street with rather small commercial buildings with the trees towering over them. In Philadelphia, in my hometown, these fastigit, meaning narrow growing ginkgo trees, transform our tiny 18th century streets confined by narrow, what we call uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost houses. These are uh, three-room row houses with one room over the other stacked vertically. These trees also shade the entire height of the facades from our brutal summer sun. Even tinier streets and tinier houses can have a palette of small-scale decorative street trees with seasonal interest. Back again in South Philly, these flowering cherry trees serendipitously planted opposite each other flank the entrance to a tiny street, bringing down the scale, thereby creating an effect on our boreal gate or threshold into the street beyond. When it comes to street trees, bright, non-green color is just not about flowers, at least not in our colder, frosty climates to the north. The colors of autumn leaves can be striking in some species and very dependable, happening every fall and transforming the foliage to gold, crimson, or purple. These are ginkgo trees in Philly. Street trees, when seen in perspective, looking down the street, can block, screen, and unify an otherwise very divergent view of various architectures and facade designs. They can bring order and coherence to a rather chaotic streetscape. In our urban parks, the trees can screen out the city view, if not the city sound. In summer, these tall, this tall building in the back will be totally hidden by the foliage of the foreground trees. The ubiquity of certain trees can be iconic identifiers and reinforcers of sense of place. In this case, Pinus pinea, the stone pine, marks this view as being in Rome, Italy. We've left Rome and we're now in Palm Springs, California. The, uh, tree, this palm tree is native to the palm canyons and those uh, mountains in the background of this image, only a few miles away. While the palms do not do much to mitigate the heat island effect in the cities, they do convey a sense of place. While culturally, aesthetically, and socially, this use of extensively planted but a limited palette of trees may have a certain design appeal, biologically it can be irrational and disastrous. It is a monoculture, and monocultures are very vulnerable to the depredations of those pest organisms that love that particular tree. A design diversity of tree species should become the new norm, as uh, Mary told us in her previous presentation. My last point to note about trees is their reinforcement and enhancement of environmental ephemera, like seasonality and its manifestations. The snow on these branches certainly tell us it is winter. The effect might only last a few hours before blowing or falling off, the ephemera part. But those of us that know this particular hawthorn are reminded of the spring to come when we look at it in the winter. Here's the same tree three months later. The springtime flowers are held on the tops of the branches, just like last winter's snow. As Mary told us, trees in the city and in the suburbs can be a visual delight, but they cannot realize their potential without our informed help. They need room below ground for their roots and room above ground, as this photo shows, for their canopies. 
City trees in the public realm should be considered part of the in city infrastructure and must be taken as seriously as the plumbing and electrical utilities that are underneath and around them. Their presence in the street or plaza must be planned and designed for. We know trees are good for us. They can heighten our sense of place and season. They screen out a bit of the urban nastiness. They also create habitat for other life forms by providing food, shelter, and nesting opportunities. They provide measurable environmental benefits. They can sequester carbon. They are, through their shade, they can mitigate the heat island effect of all the masonry walls and dark colored pavements that would otherwise be absorbing the direct rays of the sun. They improve air quality by catching particulate fallout on their leaves, and they introduce oxygen back into the atmosphere as part of their photosynthetic processes. They can be incorporated into green infrastructure systems to help capture stormwater runoff and facilitate groundwater re recharge. If you remember only one thing about trees, remember this because all else, all else flows from it. They are alive. When they are healthy and robustly growing, they are living organisms that are in balance with their environment. A living tree that is healthy is in balance. It has the water, the soil volume that is necessary for its size. If one of these are missing, one or two things will happen. The tree will either start to decline and die back, or it will not achieve its potential size and in fact become a, a rather large bonsai. Good city trees come from great nurseries. There are very few of these in the United States, unfortunately. Germany has quite a few. It must go back to their ancient tribal animus days when they lived in the forest and worshiped the trees. This is a nursery near Hamburg that specializes in growing large-sized specimen trees. Most of its clients, believe it or not, are cities, not the very, root, not the very rich. He prunes these trees on a regular schedule. If you wash the soil off the tree root ball, you'd find this is the extent of the fibrous roots of that tree. A tree with a root system like this will survive uh, transplanting very, very successfully at very large sizes. As I said, trees in the city are infrastructure. They are in competition for root and crown space. This is an axonometric view of a street in Battery Park City in New York that we drew to demonstrate how continuous tree pits for tree roots would be coordinated with the other utilities under the street. As I mentioned earlier, the design of the planting of street trees can also be used as part of the stormwater management for a development, as we are doing in a new community we are designing in Northern California. The tree pits are connected to the curbside rain gardens that are designed to do double duty. They irrigate the trees and detain and recharge the stormwater. Uh, Architectural Graphic Standards has a very good summary of James Urban's, James Urban's thinking on how to grow street trees effectively in cities and towns. This is a double page spread from Architectural Graphic Standards that shows how to determine the volume of planting soil that a tree of a certain size will require to grow to that size. The chart in the upper left hand corner is where that, uh, you can make that tabulation. It also shows various strategies and techniques for getting the volume of soil in an urban setting that is mostly a paved environment of sidewalks, plazas, and streets. Uh, for the Westbury Circus traffic circle we did in Canary Wharf in London, we used Jim Urban's early soil volume formulas to determine the soil volumes and therefore the size of the planters for a double row of London plane trees to be planted around the periphery of this traffic circle. The plane trees are planted over a parking garage. The planters are the rectangular notches that radiate towards around the circle in this photo. This is an image of one of the planters before installing the planting soil, showing the waterproofing and drainage gra uh, gravel aeration layer at the bottom of the pit. This is one of the large specimen trees getting ready to leave the German nursery that I mentioned earlier. This is the, fi uh, the final planting uh, circle. This photograph was taken one year after the completion of planting. Quite often in cities and towns we do not have the luxury of being able to plant trees in lawn, ground cover, or shrub beds. More often the demands of the urban congestion require planting trees in pavement. The biological of the plant are still the same. It needs soil of the correct volume, chemistry, irrigation, it needs air in the soil pores, drainage, etc. This large tree is in balance. It's extremely healthy and somehow it has the soil it needed to achieve this height. But where is this soil to be found? The tree, like most in cities, 
is planted originally in a four by four foot tree pit without irrigation or drainage. More than likely, this is the situation that it's in now, uh, in the way it's growing now. The tree roots are probably under the pavement itself, growing in the granule mineral substrate that's beneath the concrete sidewalk. As a result of, un as this is the result of such uncontrolled and unplanned situation. The trees are opportunists, the roots will go where they find suitable habitat. In this case, the gravel and moisture underneath the uh, sidewalk provide a great growing substrate, not only for that previous tree, but for this one. But because the roots are shallow, the trees are easily toppable in a high wind or a bad storm. Tree roots can go under pavement, but the pavement needs a structural support so it does not cave in, crack, or sink. We don't use too many permeable pavements in our office because sometimes they do not remain permeable over a long time. Uh, the trees, trees must root deeply so they do not topple. There are two basic ways of supporting pavement over tree roots. The first is a suspended system that I will talk about momentarily, and the second is called structural planting soil. That is planting soil that has so much mineral rock in it that it will support the pavement. There are basically two kinds of structural soil. One is called the Amsterdam mix that is mostly sand and was developed in the city of Amsterdam. And the other is mostly gravel called the Cornell mix invented by Nina Bassick at Cornell University. Both of these soil types depend on the mix having mineral grains, sand or gravel, that actually supports the pavement above them. These roots have a minimum amount of organics between the mineral grains for the use of the tree roots. They are both rather technical and expensive to buy and install, and they require expertise in their, in their installation. This is a web page for Amsterdam Sam Mix Structural Soil. This is the home page for the Urban Horticultural Institute at Cornell that developed the Cornell Gravel Structural Planting Soil Mix. James, Urban's, James Urban and others have argued that these structural soil mixes have too much rock and sand at the expense of soil usable for tree roots and that the soil volume must be therefore increased to account for all the space that the mineral content takes up to support the work of holding up the pavement. The other method for paving over tree root soil volumes is called suspended paving. The paving is supported or suspended by a rigid structure that basically allows the pavement to bridge over the planting soil. Deep root is a soil cell system that's manufactured by SilvaCell for supporting pavement above and over tree planting soil. This is an image from their web page. The world normally plants trees as per the left-hand illustration. We should start doing it as per the middle and right-hand sections. These were drawings we did for a project in New York City to demonstrate the soil volume we needed to make the trees of the sizes we wanted both viable and safe assuring that they would reach their design sizes at maturity and would still fit around and between all the existing utilities that we needed. The shapes of the canopy that are shown in the middle and right hand side may look odd because in this particular case the proposed LA tree pits trees were to be um, pruned into aerial hedges and the right hand tree was going to be made into a pollard and I will talk about these techniques a bit later. Groves of trees can share each other's root volume, meaning you do not necessarily have to double the soil volume for two trees. One and a half times the amount of soil or so may work for two trees instead of actually doubling it, but you sort of have to know the trees in question. Here is a diagram of how suspended pavement works and how we are using it uh, under pavement to, uh, uh, how we are using uh, suspended pavement to bridge over the uh, planting soil area and using the planting soil to actually hold the runoff from the pavement. The storm water of the, pay of the plaza is drained into the tree pits. The planting soil retains most of the runoff and in periods of high rainfall the excess water overflows to an underground detention system that releases it more slowly into the sewer system. This is an integration of drainage and tree planting systems. Unfortunately, sometimes you have to cut down some existing trees in the city to allow for new development. Politically, this news is usually not well received, even for existing trees in poor shape and growing in bad conditions, a very typical situation in American cities. So one should be prepared to demonstrate that the new trees will be better than the old, presuming, of course, that the new replacement trees will be part of the new scheme. 
The following few images show the computations my firm did on a project requiring the takedown of some existing trees that, while tall, had very bad form and were planted in tiny tree pits. They compare the environmental benefits of the new tree planting system over the old and the new trees over the old. This image shows our computation of the immediate stormwater benefits of the suspended paving system I just described in my previous slide. Stormwater storage on this site increased almost 900% by integrating the planting soil into the stormwater uh, system. And that effect would be immediate upon uh, installation of the trees and the pavement. The next two slides show a couple of the other benefits over time of new trees that are replacing the existing ones. It will take a few years for the youngsters to overtake the existing trees, but this happens, but it is remarkable how quickly they do so. For the dry weight biomass of our new trees, it started to exceed the existing trees in just about eight years. Over 50 years, the increase to biomass of our new trees compared to the existing is about 148,000 pounds. Carbon stored over 50 years from the same plantation is 175 tons more than could be expected from the existing trees, with the point of payback between the new and the old happening at about eight years or so. We did computations to compare our new trees with the existing trees for these six factors, showing the net benefit over 50 years for, of the new, that the new trees would have. As I mentioned, the point of payback was between eight and 10 years for five of the factors and, immediately, and immediate for the stormwater effect. The computations we did to evaluate our trees as well as the existing ones are available for free from the USDA Department of Forestry web pages. These are two of those web pages. This is another web page called the iTree that I think Mary mentioned that also has formula for computing the benefits of trees. Now I'll quickly go through some special techniques that we have used for trees in the city. If you, can't, if you want to plant a large tree but don't have enough room for the soil, here are two techniques for decreasing the canopy size and keeping the tree in balance with its soil volume. These are not commonly practiced, these techniques are not commonly practiced in the United States. They have a long track record in Europe and are visually very compatible with many styles of historical architecture, especially the Grand Beaux-Arts. Both techniques should be begun in the nursery prior to planting if possible. Because they contain the height and spread of the tree, the trees do request, require less soil volume. And while the effects can be visually striking, in truth they are not to everyone's taste. These are uh, an example of the first technique I'm going to talk about. It's called aerial hedging. Uh, when one sees this, one does think of Paris. This is the Palais Royal. It's basically keeping the trees trimmed to a tight canopy and a little tight a linear formation. These are the typical dimensions for an aerial hedge using a canopy shade tree. Hardy trees that make great aerial hedges are hornbeams, lindens, and certain maples. And if you're willing to uh, do the pruning, which happens once or twice a year, you can keep them indefinitely. One begins the hedging process while trees are still in the nursery if possible. One year in advance of planting is fine for an aerial hedge, but with the right tree selection, the trimming could be started immediately after planting is completed. Since the effect is not immediate, one must make sure that the owner knows that this effect is produced as a product of delayed gratification. The following images show the transformation of the newly planted trees into an aerial hedge uh, over time. This is the effect of the trees after they were newly, would be newly planted. Here is the aerial hedge five years on. It still has not achieved its height, but it's beginning to be tapered on the sides. After 10 years, it's almost touching its designed height. And then it's finally closed and achieved its desired effect after about 15 years. Again, these trees could, will need only to be pruned once or twice a year, depending on how, price, how precise the effect is. And as I said, they can be striking in winter as they are in summer, but this is very much trees as architecture. The other special tree pruning and height controlling technique I want to mention is called pollarding. Pollarding is the removal of all the branches of a tree to a certain datum on what's uh, called their structural branches. This is done once a year in the late winter when the tree is dormant. Pollarded trees can live indefinitely. London cranes take pollarding very well, as do lindens and white mulberries. Again, similarly to the aerial hedge, one should explain 
uh, to the owner who is buying this technique that pollarding will take, tends to require a bit of time to be achieved. However, it happens much faster with pollards than it does for the aerial hedge. This is what the pollards would look like upon planting, about five years after planting, and then they've pretty much achieved what they're going to do within 10 years. This is a good way to handle plant material architecturally, particularly in this case we wanted to control views of the uh, monumental building behind, a very important art institution. In cold climates with short days and when sunlight's important, the branch removal allows maximum sun penetration to the ground. In spring, the tree sends out a great number of shoots with very heavy foliage that produces maximum shade in the summer. Here are some shots of how it was actually done in the nursery. The tree on the right is the unpruned tree. The tree on the left is beginning to get its very first a pruning in the nursery. This is a California nursery. That's why all the trees are in wooden boxes. Uh, the second year in the nursery, the tree is getting two prunings, uh, uh, one in the winter and one in uh, late summer. The branches, what we're calling the structural branches, are being tied down so they become more horizontal. At the end of the second year, the trees were boxed and were ready for planting. They are shipped to the site in covered containers, and this is the way trees should be shipped uh, in covered containers, whether they are in leaf or not, or whether they're pollarded or not, they should be protected in root from the nursery. Here are the newly planted trees. They're getting their second summer pruning uh, right after planting. They, however, will, after this pruning, will only be pruned once a year in the winter. This is the final uh, installation of those trees taken about five years after they were planted. The planting bed is continuous from tree to tree. There's no individual tree pits. The soil volume of the continuous pit was based on the design size of the mature pollards, not on the size of an unpruned plane tree that can grow much larger. These are plane trees. And in this particular instance, the cobblestone pavers are, in, are permeable and they are stalled over the Cornell mix structural uh, planting soil. So in conclusion, if you look at this ancient Greek jar, you will see a tree on the left-hand part of it. That actually is an oriental plane tree. Trees in cities have been around a long time. Obviously, trees in forests have been around much longer. The ancient Greeks planted larger trees to shade the agora. They probably used the oriental plain. They planted smaller, more decorative trees at the base of certain temples to create a green base to the temple, as in the case of this temple of Hephaestus in Athens. The love of trees seems to span the breadth and history of human cultures. I would like to conclude my presentation with this ancient Chinese proverb. The best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time to plant a tree is right now. Thank you. time, but if there's any questions, there's some mics, uh, that anyone has any questions for uh, three speakers? We answer everything. Uh, there we go. Nathan. Yes. Uh, my, uh, there it's, it's working. Um, my question is, what are uh, the best examples, you would say, of cities who followed the principles that you're advocating today? I'd like to hear from each of you briefly. I'll start because in Philadelphia we have something called the Pennsylvania Hort Society that has been uh, their unofficial mission for the last 20 or 30 years since Ernesto Ballard became their president was to improve and beautify the city of Philadelphia through horticulture. They have a social mission as well. They have community gardens and they were one of the first in the country to take over vacant land and convert them into community gardens and economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. They would provide the soil and seeds and things for those, those neighbors if they had enough neighbors who said they would take care of it. As a result of that, most of those sh slides I showed you in the early part of the presentation were street trees that probably were planted by the Hort Society. Uh, unfortunately, as Mary said, their planting is a bit all over the map with regards to species. They do, you will find up everything on the street from red buds to yellow wood to liquid ambers. Um, there's not a lot of what I would call design coherence behind it, but boy, there's a lot of diversity behind it 
and there's so many different species of trees all over the city that it literally is a, uh, an arboretum, a collection. They are certainly not all native, however. So. Barry, you have a favorite city that follows these principles that you talked about? Um, well, I grew up in Boston in um, uh, Olmsted's emerald necklace, and part of what his early plan pioneered was a type of civil engineering that worked with the natural systems and protected the uh, urban watershed from flooding through reserves in, the, in the, one of the first um, metropolitan district areas. And so they were, he was able to build a connected greenways and corridors and uh, the Emerald Necklace. Um, so that's one of my favorite cities. <laughs> I, I think I would have to agree with Mary there. I'm not, um, in terms of sort of overall landscape ecology, um, maybe there's others out there that could help me, but I'm not so sure that there are real good examples yet of that. Yes. Um, my question is uh, mainly on the landscape ecology topic. Uh, there seems to be an ongoing debate in the green, sustainable, and regenerative design circles whether or not a building and the networks of transportation leading to it can be zero impact. Now, I'm wondering, um, in your opinion, and you've addressed this briefly, do you, are you in support of regulations that really keep existing green areas intact, or do you think um, we should allow for creativity and innovation for architects to go above and beyond um, and, and experiment? Um. Uh, there's certainly there, there's certainly room for architects and planners to go above and beyond and be creative, and I'm not suggesting at all that that we sort of take a step backwards. We can't do that, and we've um, our, our cities need to be culturally and economically rich as well as ecologically rich. So I think that we need to find ways of combining all three of those. I don't think as a society we put much emphasis or importance on our green infrastructure. And I think that we're all wrapped up now with LEED, which is great. It's really waking up a, a lot of people to the idea of sustainability from an energy standpoint and a material standpoint, but I would still argue from an ecological carrying capacity standpoint, it's not there yet. And that if we, if we can put as much um, uh, importance and as much effort into, green, into designing our green infrastructure as we do our built infrastructure, then I think we can get there. Yes, next question. Locally, we um, of course live in a subtropical climate and we've had you know, good, good successes in the last 10 or 20 years in planting street trees that provide this canopy. Unfortunately, they're in constrained areas like you've talked about. Curbs are being raised, sidewalks are being damaged. And with the economic times, you know, there's been a lot of um, concern about cutting costs and not, not having to repair those sidewalks and let's replace those oak trees with palm trees, reduce the canopy. Um, it's been a huge controversial issue locally and in the community I represent in Jupiter. Um, are there any studies that, that you can refer to aside from quality of life issues where there's actually cost benefit, where the tree has more value um, than perhaps the cost of replacing these sidewalks? Because the, the momentum is, is continuing to increase where the trees are losing this battle. And, and we are locally, at least, in, in Jupiter, looking at the bioswale um, as a new approach and trying to combine drainage and be more efficient with the use of, of land. But really the issue is more retrofit in dealing with existing circumstances. Well, I think Mary showed, the, I think, the, the cost benefits of trees over a certain period. I think in Mary's presentation she showed a chart where she showed the, the benefit of, of trees over a certain period of time. I don't think those values are widespread and people some may feel that the math is a bit suspicious. Uh, but we're getting into it because our work is, is in urban situations quite often and sometimes we have, uh, we have to get rid of existing trees and so we really do have to come up with strong arguments for replacing them. Um, and 
but it's, it's really hard, I think, to make the sale, to, you know, because it does cost a lot of money, and I don't think people understand the benefit, really, you know. The, isn't isn't the, part of the problem the reason that trees start to heave sidewalks because they're, know, their roots are trying to get oxygen and they're not planted right? More than likely, yeah. In Philadelphia, a lot of the infrastructure is 18th century, so the soil compaction wasn't that bad, and we're lucky to have very large trees next to very old houses. The way things are constructed now, the soil compaction is horrendous, so the tree roots are actually stay near the surface where they have moisture, and so they cause a lot of problems, and the, like that one that toppled over that I showed. That when trees are correctly planted, there shouldn't be an issue with the pavement buckling and creating. What you're seeing is the results of, of poorly planned or poorly understood tree pits initially. Well, um, I think I, one of the ahead. other important things to ask yourself is you need to look at the whole picture, the, the, the context of the whole watershed in a way, or, or the, for, so it's not just this specific tree and this sidewalk that's heaved, but the whole way that the uh, trees and the infrastructure and the city work together, and, it, and it, in my view, it's uh, they're not separate issues. If, um, planning for better green infrastructure solves a lot more problems than just trying to um, enlarge sewer systems or stormwater systems or pave more uh, area for road speed or all of those things. So when you start to put all of those things together with a green infrastructure, as this incredibly important part of sustainable urban and civic life, then it's not just about replace the cost of replacing a sidewalk. You're looking at the whole uh, ecology of the city, really, and trying to um, uh, um, steward that as, as a, a healthy place. I think one, one of the one of the issues I see out there now is that for some reason green infrastructure really means blue infrastructure. It means stormwater management, and not many people, even EPA, tags it that way. That green infrastructure is all about stormwater, and really, to me, we need to be thinking beyond even green infrastructure to living infrastructure. How can we make all our inf infrastructure either alive? or how can we engage it with living systems, or how can we enhance or embellish living systems. And I think that if we look at that from a whole system standpoint, as Mary was talking about, then I think we can start hopefully solving some of these issues or these conflicts so that we get that rich cultural, economic, vibrant city, but we also get a rich, a, a rich ecology as well. Uh, I, I hate to cut this off, but I think we're really out of time. Uh, I just want to urge you all that we do have handouts uh, with bios as well as uh, references uh, and websites that uh, our three speakers have referenced today. Uh, please help yourself to one of these uh, handouts. And uh, I also want to urge everybody to come to the Athena Award at the Himmel at 5.30 today. And please join me in giving our speakers a round of applause. Uh, Mary, Keith, and Dennis, thank you.